well, you don't hear a whole lot from the lender, but if, you know, if there are hiccups within the business, having the direct line of sight to the ultimate lender to, to talk to the people that are making the decisions on, all right, well, I can't make this payment or I need to delay this payment. If you're direct to the lender, there's no ambiguity, right? If you're going to borrow money, you know, work kind of backwards. Like, when do you expect you can pay that back? And is it a short-term capital like gap that you're filling or is it more of a long-term capital gap? Like, for example, if you're buying a piece of equipment that you're going to use for three, four, five, ten 10 years, you probably can't take a six month loan to pay for that equipment because the revenue generated by the equipment will not keep up with the loan payments, right? So you really want to kind of match the, I would say the use of the funds with the anticipated like repayment schedule. Like um, to your point earlier, you know, right? Now I think one thing that is often overlooked by individuals running businesses is you need to start network networking with financing people, whether that's banks, alternative lenders, because if you build a relationship with them over a year or two, and then you come to them with a capital need, the probability of success is much, all things being equal, is much higher than if you met them yesterday. Welcome everybody to the next episode of the Construction MFers podcast. My name is Scott Pieper, CEO and founder of Mobilization Funding. And today I have a great guest here with me. He is the co-CEO of Breakout Finance and the co-CEO and founder of Altriarch. McLean Wilson is also a great friend of mine and someone I've come to enjoy a lot in this industry. Amongst a lot of different people that you meet in our world, very few I can say the same things about. So today I welcome him to you and I can't wait to show you what he knows. McLean, welcome. Yeah, yeah thanks Scott for having yeah, me. Yeah, no problem, it. man. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate you coming all the way down too. No problem. So let's, I talk a lot about mindset, mentality, what you can do, everything happens for you, not to you. And there are things I really truly believe. Our relationship and how we met mm -hmm. is a great example of that. Um, and for those of you that I know, McLean and what Breakout does and what Altrek does is they lend to either direct to companies like we do, or they'll lend to lenders and other companies mm -hmm. through the Altrek model. But how we met was in both in a disaster scenario where we lent to the same customer mm -hmm. who turned out, long story short, to go all the way into bankruptcy, all the way into insolvency, all the way into personal bankruptcy, and what a lot of it was a fraud in mm -hmm. some ways. And yep. you and I met through that, and where a lot of people come and start slinging arrows at each other, <laughs> you and I picked up the phone and just called one another. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe you could tell your perspective of that story. I don't even know if I've even heard that, but you know. At the time, you didn't know who mobilization funding was. I mean, honestly, we met, and yeah, I didn't I, really I, know Breakout or, and I had no idea about Altriarch. I think I'd heard of mobilization funding just given kind of, you know, construction financing, which we don't mm -hmm. do a whole lot of. And so, you know, once I, I saw you guys were in the deal and, you know, the deal started to go south, you guys were in it for a while and then it went south very quickly on, on us, for example. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't for, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. It was for, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars at, yeah, at this same. time. And so, you know, what, what, what I try to do in that scenario, and it's not always well received, is just pick up the phone and, and call someone and be like, you know, we, we both have money at risk here. You know, we're better working together than a, than, a, than a part here, which is abnormal for lenders to do in, mm -hmm. in, in most cases. So, uh, but anyway, we, you know, after 10, 15 minutes, I would say we, we kind of hit it off, you know, and, you know, ended up, you know, one commiserating because, you know, we did not get all of our money back. Um, spoiler, spoiler alert there. So, uh, but we ended up, you know, working out, you know, becoming, you know, friends and we've done tons and tons of other business that's way more than made up for whatever losses we we, we incurred in that particular transaction. So, uh, but yeah, no, kind of became, you know, pretty fast friends and, you know, yeah. do a lot of deals together. I mean, honestly, I can tell you at the time that happened, this is before COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So four or five years ago, um, it definitely was a stinger. I mean, mm -hmm. at the time I felt like it was you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, like you said. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and to think at the time, like, wow, this is happening for me, not to me, is, was a tough concept mm -hmm. to get my arm around, to be mm -hmm. honest, you yeah. know? And so thinking back now, though, looking back five years, it was actually a gift. Like, mm -hmm. we've done way many more mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars worth of partnerships and helped countless other businesses mm -hmm. together, um, the relationships, the connections. And so... I started that with this conversation because very, very, for a very long period of my life, it would have been hard to get into a relationship like that and think anything positive. Mm -hmm. And to whatever 
serendipitous way that happened and occurred. This is a perfect example of exactly that. And now here you are on the podcast. We're going to talk about financing. What's a great form of financing? How to help the same customers that we both see a lot of, whether they're in construction or other industries. You help a lot of both. Um, and we've been able to create nuanced lending programs for customers that are kind of in a blend and in between or ready to be bankable or just need, they are bankable, but need extra amounts of capital because their growth rates are fast. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's even cooler now we can sit here and talk about that and how people can actually get prepared to help them get the right financing. Definitely. I think it's kind of cool for our respective companies as well. We've kind of taken a similar like trajectory, right? Like we were a lot smaller five years ago than we are than we are today. Yeah. And that's for a lot of different reasons, which we can maybe get into later. But. So let's jump into um, Breakout First and Altriarch. What do, what do we each do? So everyone can say, okay, well, we know what mobilization funding does if you watched us here. Mm -hmm. But what does Breakout and Altriarch do, and how do they differ between the two of them? Yeah, yeah, happy to get into that. Um, I've got a bad habit of doing you know two things at, at once a lot of the time. <laughs> you know, it drives my wife crazy on occasion. But um, so, so Breakout Capital, we provide term loans to small businesses. We also provide uh, factoring or you know accounts receivable finance uh, to small businesses in you know roughly 47, 48 states throughout the U.S. So think of you know short duration working capital. We're directly to the small business. You know we underwrite. We fund, we service, we do everything in-house. Um, you know, we've got offices in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and then a lot of remote uh, workers throughout the country. We've got about 40 or so people uh, total. So, you know, that's our kind of direct to small business uh, company. Um, whereas Altriarch, you know, I've been, I've been a part of a startup of, you know, a couple of different factoring companies or alter alternative lenders. And, you know, finding, you know, clients to give money to is not particularly the most difficult thing, but finding the capital to which supply to small businesses is, very very tough especially when the startup mode so you know businesses have the same you know small business has the same issue and you know lenders have the same issue as well especially when yeah. you're starting out so we created ultra which is a a fund um where we provide capital to alternative lenders and in, in various formats um but you know we have tried to identify good operators good people um that are doing uh, lending the right way and we, we want to back them and we're very fortunate we have some really good you know limited partners as as investors as well which allows us to do that so one of the mistakes I made when we first met was I accused you of being a merchant cash advance lender, and you quickly separated yourself from mm -hmm. that, which resonated with me because I do the same thing. We get accused or thought of in the same way. And not that all merchant cash advances are bad, but in the world that we service, they tend to go very, very bad, very, very mm -hmm. fast. And many people utilize the some aspects of con the construction industry, in my opinion, to provide loans to them whether they're direct or coming from the broker world, mm -hmm. and you quickly identified why you're not and, and articulated in a way that I that really resonated with me quickly in a place where I'm usually not listening well to yeah. that line. <laughs> so maybe you could tell in your own words, like how it, how is breakout and then your term mm -hmm. loans different from a merchant cash advance lender? And then I can chime in on what I think too. Yeah, so uh, the merchant cash advance industry, one, it, you know, it's been around for 15, you know, 17 years at this point. And um, there, are, there are good operators, there are good companies out there that, that do that, but that's not the majority of it. So it tends to have kind of a tarnished reputation out there. But a merchant cash advance is, you know, it's the purchase of a future receivable. So if you borrow, let's just say $100,000, and borrow is a loose term, but I won't get to the legalese of it. But let's say you take an advance of $100,000 from a merchant cash advance company. Whether you pay that advance back in 24 hours, 48 hours, or you pay it back in a year, which may be the original term, you're going to pay back the same amount. So, you know, it's a purchase. It is not a loan. Um, our loans at Breakout, they amortize just like, you know, your mortgage on your house, right? It's a principal and interest payment, you know, depending on if it's weekly or monthly payments. It's principal and interest every single time. And when you want to pay back, you know, let's say you want to pay it off halfway through the term, you don't pay all the principal and remaining interest, you just pay the principal back. So it, it operates almost exactly like a home mortgage. Um, and we do have, you know, as we've kind of, you know, developed and you know, become more mature in our business, you know, we did realize, you know, you know, a 12 to 24 month duration term loan may not be the best thing for every business, right? And so we're very adamant about matching the actual needs of the business with the structure of our underlying loan products. And so we've got a variety of those just depending on, on the need and, you know, we, we, we are firm believers that we don't just pick our product and kind of shove it down the throats <laughs> of folks, but we actually structure it around so that, you know, the capital we're providing, you know, you know, solves the problem that or the opportunity. It creates, you know, the, the, the ability to solve the opportunity that is created, which we look for 
uh, a lot of times. And so it's really about just, you know, making sure that the source of capital is, you know, alongside the actual uses of funds. Nice. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you in a key delineation, I think, is you made a note, like if you have to take a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollar advance and it has some fee associated to it, someone's going to pay back, you know, $140,000 mm -hmm. on a hundred, they got a hundred, they're going to pay back 140. But if someone were to call in 60 days and say, okay, what's my payoff? The payoff is 140 less whatever you pay. Exactly, exactly right. Exactly right. Whereas in an amortizing loan, if you're making principal and interest payments along the way, it's a hundred thousand dollars. And yeah, over a course of the same year, maybe you'd have paid 140, but in 60 days, you now have principal and interest paid down of some kind. Mm -hmm. So now you have a hundred thousand less the principal payments, and there you go. There's, exactly. your, there's what you pay back. Exactly. And so that's the biggest difference, I think. The other thing that you mentioned that I think is very important for people to understand is. When you're working directly with the lender, mm -hmm. it's a big difference between not working directly with the lender. And if you're working directly with the lender, they're making their own decisions, it's their own capital, and they service the loan, that's like the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Because I think everybody, even in the mortgage world, you've all gone to your bank, got a mortgage, three months later got a letter that says, some company you never heard of before is now servicing your loan. And sometimes it doesn't mean anything, sometimes it does, but in, in an alternative sense, when you're a short-term loan and with a lot of different parameters or a certain non-traditional structure and you're not being serviced by the person you worked with on the front end, there's a lot of room for things to go bad. Mm -hmm. And so talk through why that's important and why it was important for you all to keep that tight. I mean, you have your own salespeople, you do work through some referral basis, I think we all do, but the gross majority of the stuff that you work with come direct through to you. Yes, I think it's extremely important to work with a direct lender. Um, you know, not not to say there aren't good brokers out there. There, there definitely are. Um, like some things to identify good brokers are, you know, you know, what other lenders do you work with? Do you work with one lender? Do you work with multiple lenders? You know, and if you are getting offers, you know, ask to get offers from multiple lenders. So you can kind of feel the feel the market out. Um, ask if their licensing requirements. They're typically are not within the in the loan world, but some um, do. Like if you do deals in California, you have to be licensed in California. So that question should be that question should be asked up front. Um, and as far as you know, our our business, you know, working directly with us, you know, we do try to underwrite. Everyone has a credit box, right? So you know, we, we do need to you know do about seventy percent of the work that's you know somewhat within the credit box, but then we have the rest of it that is very situational. Um, typically, typically you also pay a little bit less going direct to a lender because the brokers do take. Uh, fees that the lenders pay them, right? And the, what the, the lender prices those into the deal, like you know, a mortgage or any kind of traditional loan transaction, whether it's you know, a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred million, doesn't matter. Um, that broker is still getting paid, and, and the borrower is always going to pay that. So, right. going directly to the lender is very important. Um, and to your point, also, Scott, of you know, when things are all going well, you don't hear a whole lot from the lender. But if you know, if there are hiccups within the business, having the direct line of sight to the ultimate lender to to talk to the people that are making the decisions on all right, well, I can't make this payment or I need to delay this payment. If you're direct to the lender, there's no ambiguity, right? It's black and white. You can go there. You can work out and what is best for the business and for the lender. And the lender will nine times out of 10 work with you and modify the loan and or restructure to make sure that, you know, everybody gets made whole over, over time. It doesn't adversely affect the small business. Yeah, and I think a good question too, um, that actually a great broker told me was like, I always tell my clients, ask, ask your bro like ask the other brokers if you can speak to the lender. And if they don't want to let you speak to mm -hmm. the lender, they don't have a good relationship with the lender, mm -hmm. which is exactly. totally true. Because as being a lender, there isn't a person on, there isn't a, a broker or a consultant or a banker or another non-lender that we would never, that we wouldn't work with their client or talk to them for them and they would have any concern at all. But I could see if someone was just shopping your paper around or your application around, they're not gonna if they're not gonna let you speak to the lender. There's probably gonna be a problem. Yeah, I think I also kind of reminded me of something as well. Ask the broker what he's getting paid. Ask me. Right. Ask him what he's getting paid for the lender. I think you may be surprised, <laughs> right? At how high that is. Or ask for referrals. Like, do you have any other small businesses that you've helped that you could refer me? I just want to hear from somebody else that you did what you said you're gonna do, and you know it That's was a great a, thing. It was a you know halfway decent experience. You know, you know, borrowing money is not always a, a great experience, but yeah. you know at least it can be tolerable. So let's talk about that process too, because with with all 
business owners or leaders of businesses that are tasked with, look, we have a problem, I need some capital, or we have an opportunity and I need some capital. Mm -hmm. There's timelines associated with both, right? I think any business that's in a very urgent scenario for money, that's not the ideal spot you want to be in. Um, and all the things we just talked about can make it even worse for them in mm -hmm. terms of making decisions. But let's just assume someone is working in a little more proactive of a manner. It's not a crisis. It might be a crisis, but they have some time. What are the things they can do now to best prepare for a time where they do need to seek lending? Um, how do they assess what is the right loan for them and their business? What are the questions they should be looking at internally? And what are the types of documents they should be preparing internally for all different types of lenders? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will say most small businesses, you know, don't overly plan for their capital needs in the future. Most are run by entrepreneurs that are, you know, trying to grow the business, you know, at, you know, in whatever means that are possible. And so just the, the if the business owner can prepare just a basic financial package. And what I mean by that is, you know, financial statements on a monthly basis, right? They can be internally prepared or they can be externally prepared by your CPA or, you know, maybe internal by your CFO or controller. Um, gather your bank statements. Some businesses just have, you know, one checking account. Some have multiple accounts. So, but having that information in a consolidated place on a monthly basis. So when you go to apply for a loan or whatever kind of capital it is, you're turning around diligence items that the, the, the bank or the alternative lender is going to want within minutes or hours, not, not weeks. Because we do get an impression if it takes, you know, a month and a half to, you know, create financial statements or to get to get, to get information. So, you know, just having just the very, very basics pulled together, like again, financial statements, you know, agings, bank statements. I would also say update your PFS as well, maybe not on a monthly basis, but on a quarterly or semi-annual basis uh, is kind of the, the bare minimum to, you know, apply for loans. Um, yeah, no, I think yeah. And, right. and it goes it goes a long way. As well. Yeah, the speed, how you behave through the process is a great mm -hmm. indicator of how you behave, right? Like and behave doesn't mean like the rules you follow. It just means like you're organized or you, you're not. You're a little more organized or you're less organized. Mm -hmm. You have information, you're aware, you communicate. I think oftentimes um, one of the biggest misconceptions is that lenders are just sitting here ready to sling money out and they, 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 they know everything that you know about your own business and they don't. It's very much a hard, it's not easy to lend money and it's, it's hard to, you wanna lend money based off of a good feeling that you have that the, you like the story, you like what the person's gonna do, you're trying to really help them. Mm -hmm. And if someone is trying to give you the impression of anything different, it, it actually becomes more nerve wracking, you know, and it's hard because you, you start to feel sympathetic to the person, but you also want like help us help you, like give us some clean, good information mm -hmm. and a story and be consistent in a, in a timely manner too. Yeah, I would also, you know, inconsistent information just leads to question marks and, you know, and, and that, now the lenders are operating in the gray and lenders are typically very uncomfortable in the gray and they may start to infer things that are accurate or not accurate. And so. Yeah. Having having the accurate information and just providing it all at once like alleviates a lot of a lot of different concerns uh, for pretty much every every lender. And I, I will say now I can't speak to the banks, but every alternative lender that I know, like like us, is it's almost hair on fire every day. It's extremely busy time that we're living in right now. Yeah, especially with traditional banking right now. Yeah, and just deciphering through who can I help of the people that are trying to work with you, mm -hmm. it's the, the first thing you're gonna do is work with the people that are prepared, right? Because mm -hmm. you need everything anyway, so you might as well work with the people that get the best case scenario prepared. How can how can folks decide what are the best options for them? When you say, you know, you got a business owner, you have some, there's all different types of needs for capital. Sometimes you've had a, a blip and you're trying to bridge a gap, mm -hmm. right? A gap in revenue, you lost a customer, you had a bad project. A purchase order went wrong maybe someone stole from you mm -hmm. right um another scenario is you had that champagne moment where you walked into the you finally walked into one of those <laughs> customers you've been trying to call on forever and they gave you that po that you really been looking for or they gave you that order or that project you want it and now you're like yes and then you're like oh no crap what am i going to do how do <laughs> yeah. i finance that mm -hmm. yeah. um there's all different needs for that so how does someone know what's the best thing for them yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good and loaded question. Yeah, so I ask you <laughs> so, that. Let me give you a little yeah. feedback. Why I ask you that specifically is you have experience in the term loans. Mm -hmm. you, you know what we do. Mm -hmm. You've financed purchase order companies. You've helped finance factoring companies. Mm -hmm. You've factored 
hundreds and hundreds of millions of receivables over your career. Mm -hmm. So you have a great broad experience of when should I use factoring? When should I use term loans? When should yep. I use bank, SBA, PO funding? So that's why I'm asking that question. For yeah, this. no, so I, th I think like just the kind of very high level piece of advice is if you're gonna borrow money, you know, work kind of backwards. Like when do you expect you can pay that back? And is it a short term capital like gap that you're filling or is it more of a long term capital gap? Like, for example, if you're buying a piece of equipment that you're gonna use for three, four, five, ten 10 years, you probably can't take a six month loan to pay for that equipment because the revenue generated by the equipment will not keep up with the loan payments, right? So you really wanna kind of match the, I would say the use of the funds with the anticipated like repayment schedule. Like um, to your point earlier, you know, let's say you have a delay in receivables, right? Extremely common right now, it's, all, it's always been. Big companies push small companies out to the right on the aging. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a unfortunate, but it, you know, creates opportunity for, you know, finance folks like us. Um, but if you expect, you know, a 60 day repayment, like factoring is probably a great option for you or a short duration bridge loan is probably a good op option for you as well. You don't need to amortize a 60 day cash flow gap over 12 or 24 months, right. typically, right? You may want to, but like you should think that through as well. Um, but try to mirror and match the, the cash flow that you're trying to plug the hole in with kind of the anticipated payback schedule is by far my my biggest um, advice out there. I like that too. Matching use of funds yeah. with the fund and, and then the repayment structure mm -hmm. with the, the use of funds, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So if you're, you know, if you're using funds to buy a tractor, but you expect to pay it back with something that the tractor is not producing, mm -hmm. then you better make sure you have either really high enough margins or something that's coming over here that you can easily manage. On the flip side, if you're trying to execute that champagne moment mm -hmm. and you can confine it into that transaction, then you want to do that as well. Mm -hmm. If you have this big revenue model and you're looking at a three or four year forecast, then maybe that is an SBA loan yeah. provided you Something can longer run duration. That. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to assess that, which leads to when do you think companies should start to seek the right financial help? Whether it's you mentioned getting monthly financials and or you having your internal CFO, and I can hear some of the audience just kind of shaking their head like, "Yeah, I don't have a CFO," or "You know, I don't have that yet," and and I'm not a finance person. I just started this business. To your other point, they're entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and technicians. When should they, in their business, seek out financial expertise to do fun monthly financials to organize their books and get that under control? You know, ideally day one, right? But you know, that, that may not be you know um, reasonable when you're just trying to get the business off the ground, right? Now, I think one thing that is often overlooked by individuals running businesses is you need to start network networking with financing people, whether that's banks, alternative lenders, because if you build a relationship with them over a year or two, and then you come to them with a capital need, the probability of success is much, all things being equal, is much higher than if you met them yesterday. Oh yeah. And so I would highly, highly recommend banks, alternative lenders in your area, like local is better from a lending standpoint. Mm -hmm. Start networking early. Obviously, do what you can to get you know the financial picture of your business you know pretty buttoned up during that process. But you know if you if you meet a banker and you see them every quarter or so, and you update them on the progress, that's going to resonate in a year and a half or two when you actually do need money. It's going to make that conversation much much easier. Yeah, I, I suggest to people too all the time say, let the bank or the lender that you want to work with start. Just pretend as if you're already with them. Mm -hmm. Send them your financials every month. Send them your bank statement every month. Yeah. Send them your stuff like proactively. That. Let let yourself let them see and have their own, you know, free look. It's not there's nothing to hide. In in that case, you're trying to you're just trying to set a standard. It's a great investment of your time. Mm -hmm. If you really expect to be successful, which you should be in business, you should expect to be successful, then you should invest that time wisely up front. Because you're right. If you go to somebody and you're like, oh man, I only need a fifty grand or hundred grand, okay, great. I'll wait till I need a million. Well, newsflash, no, it's a lot easier for someone to lend 50 or 100 grand mm -hmm. than it is a million. Yeah, you and know? just ramp it up over time, right? <laughs> ramp it up yeah. over time with someone they know. Um, now, that also means some lenders are like, don't come talk to me till you need a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's those folks out there, no doubt. But those are the people you might want to prep for then. Let them see all your stuff. Okay, maybe they won't lend you a 50 or 100 grand, but maybe they would love to see all your stuff on their way there. You know? yeah, I would say also uh, lenders being banks, alternative lenders, they have different appetites at different times. So certain products they're pushing potentially, certain ones they're, they're pulling back, right? Maybe they want to go heavy into commercial real estate. Not a whole lot of folks doing that right now, right? Everyone's yeah. kind of pulling back on that business. So 
understanding kind of the appetite of, of you know prospective lenders mm -hmm. is is very important as well. So when the time comes, you can you know reasonably un understand with a high level of confidence who you can you know kind of go to for a for a shot at some capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm gonna throw some banking terms at you or lending terms at you that people always want to know. What's what is factoring? What does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. So factoring kind of at its core is financing a receivable. So small business goes out and works for a big company, right? They deliver a product or they perform a service. So they're either, you know, submitting, you know, an invoice that has, you know, people's time on it or a product on it. And that's going to be paid in terms, 30 or 60 days. The small business has already outlaid all the capital for the product. They're paying their people on a weekly or, you know, semi-monthly basis. So all of the expenses of that underlying job or product, they're already out, they're already outlaid. So the small business typically will need some kind of capital in that interim to, to bridge the gap to do what I said, pay people and pay for products. And so factoring is an advance on that receivable that's already work completed, that's already done, you know, anywhere from 70 to 95%, depending on, depending on the industry. At that point, the small business gets to work in capital they need, and th this can happen same day or within 24 hours of gener generating the invoice. So it's a very, very quick process. Um, and there are a lot of great providers um, out here. We do it, obviously, I think we do that well, but a lot of great providers um, throughout the country. And, you know, invoice gets gets paid, you know, 30 or 60 days later, it goes through the factor's lockbox, a fee is taken, and then the balance is given back to the client. And that cycle continues typically on a weekly basis for, for most, most small businesses. So why is it such a problem if someone has an SBA loan or mm -hmm. someone has a UCC in front of them? Why does that yeah. care about factoring, but it might not care for other land? Why, why is that so important? Yeah, so, so factoring, and, and it's, it's a purchase of a receivable, right? So in order to buy the actual receivable or invoice, you've got to be in a first position or a first lien position on the, on the underlying asset, which is that invoice, right? So the SBA, you know, whenever the you know SBA comes in and you know deploys capital, they're going to file a blanket UCC. The SBA has been generally pretty good about working with factoring companies. We actually um, have some templates that that we that um, we created um, a part of a nonprofit I'm involved with on the uh, on the factoring side. Help create templates for SBA subordination. So now that you know the SBA does not provide working capital like a factor does in the truest sense. They're mm -hmm. just not staffed that way, nor I, I'm not sure we want them to do that. <laughs> and so, you know, the SBA has been pretty good about sub subordinating to factoring companies, which will allow them to, you know, finance a lot more small businesses. What's the difference between recourse and non-recourse factoring? So, good, great question. So, <laughs> and there are a lot of different definitions depending who you, who you, who you ask. So, part of the audience may agree with me, part, part may not. So, non-recourse factoring is the invoice is purchased by the factor, right? Mm -hmm. They say, okay, thank you, Mr. Small Business. We have, we have purchased this. We're gonna collect the invoice. If it doesn't, we're all good here. We're not gonna come back and ask you for the money back or anything else. So we're gonna do all of our diligence up front, pre-purchase, and you know we hope it pays. Most of the time it does, right? Recourse factoring, same process of, of a purchase, but if that invoice doesn't pay, there's recourse back to the small business and potentially to the owner or the guarantors of that business. And so the factor will want to get made whole if that invoice doesn't pay. Different pricing, somewhat different structures, different contract terms. It's even very factor specific. There's there's a lot of, there's kind of mixed case law out there over what is recourse versus non-recourse depending on um, state jurisdiction uh, as well. But you know, at a very, very high level, that's a good explanation of it. And then some people say like, collateralized versus uncollateralized or that's my collateral that's their collateral so collateral is a pretty general term but what does that mean in this non-bank world when we're looking at like you mentioned like a blanket mm -hmm. security position across all collateral like what are the different buckets of collateral how do they get broken out who owns what when do they own them and how does that all figured out yeah so there's you, know, kind of like you said it's got the the blanket terms just an all-asset lien right that's all-encompassing uh, but if you break it down further, you know, most businesses have receivables, they have equipment, they've got, you know, intellectual property, um, potentially. Um, it's a handful of other sub, sub segments as well, um, accounts, if you will, right? So accounts are invoices, um, um, effectively, you know, there's cash that's a deposit in banks as a form of collateral as, as well. Um, certain lenders, such as, as factors, for example, they, they laser focus into the receivables of the, of the business. And they want to be in a first lien on that. 
they could probably care less about the equipment or if there's real estate involved. That's obviously a mortgage, but you know, some some small businesses do have real estate attached. Um, you know, a factor will not care about equipment more more than likely um, as well or inventory for that example. So. You know, lenders get very, very picky over the uh, collateral and they're, they're specialists, right? They're inventory specialists, they're equipment specialists, you know, uh, receivable specialists as, as well. And uh, a lot of the times, you know, lenders will enter into, you know, either inter creditor agreements or subordination agreements just to very, very clearly define while everything is still good and everyone's happy mm-hmm. that the um, that the collateral is, you know, adequately outlined and everyone, you know, has the rights to the collateral that they need to have. Right. When you're looking for, um the right fit from a non-bank. So you're thinking about now we're going to finance a non-bank, right? Mm-hmm. So we talked a lot about consumers. Yeah. And you mentioned finding like all the traits that you're looking for to be prepared. But mm-hmm. what if someone is looking for like you at helping finance non-banks? Mm-hmm. Like what are you looking for when you're trying to look at how they finance a non-bank? Like a non-bank decides. So maybe it's another maybe it is a term loan provider, maybe it's a factoring mm-hmm. company, maybe it's somebody like mobilization funding or any other PO funder that comes out, how do you decide how you're gonna help that company knowing that they're gonna engage with a consumer base of some kind? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's arguably harder than, than being direct. Yeah. You're kind of one level removed, right? And so th- this definitely, this falls on the, uh, the ultra arc side of our house. Um, you know, we, we, I think we're funding eight or nine separate factoring companies um, right, right now. And so, you know, we've been, we've been at it for, you know, a few years at, at this point. But, you know, we like people with experience. Uh, th- this business, you know, I think if, you know, I, I don't have an MBA, I didn't go to business school or anything like that. So, you know, I think uh, I've, I've asked before people who have MBAs and they were like, they didn't even cover factoring or, <laughs> or you know, alternative lending maybe got a 20 minute, you know, you know, segment at some point, right? So it's very much not taught in school. It's a lot of people have come up in the industry. And so, you know, while factoring has been around for literally hundreds of, hundreds of years, as is, you know, the financing of, of businesses, um, it's really kind of become more, I would say, a mainstay um, um, recently. So we're starting to see some second and third generation folks come up. And, you know, we like people that have been doing it for 20 or 30 years and now they're going out on their own. Or, you know, they've, they've you know, it's a group of, you know, typically you have a salesperson, operations person that'll leave a bigger company and go start, mm-hmm. their, go start their own thing. And so, you know, you got to have the op- operations piece. That's where the money's made. The, 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 the sales necessary though no to drive, doubt. right? So, no doubt. Um, but no, really experience. You got to have experience. Like we just would not fund a, we, we have funded a handful of startups um, in this, in this, in this industry, but you got to have experience um, in, in order to do that. And you got to do what you say you do within your policies, and procedures and your operations manual where you like, we, we audit that heavily. And so, you know, if you say you verify every invoice and we ask for the backup on these invoices you purchased a year ago and there's nothing, it's like, what's going on? What's going on here? Right. So, um, so it's really, it's kind of a, I mean, I don't want to say a general life badge, like do what you say you do. Right. And you know, if you do that, it tends to be very easy it's um, true. To, to do that. So you got Altriarch, which is growing fast. Mm-hmm. You have Breakout Finance, which has been growing fast. Mm-hmm. What's what's the next three to five years look like for you guys? What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Well, it's it's we're kind of out of the. I feel like we're out of the startup. Mode. We're like a, you know we're like in middle middle school. I feel like it's probably a good a good example. <laughs> it's a great um, so we're you know we 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 haven't we haven't made it by any means. I'm not even sure what that actually means, but um, you know when it when it stops being fun, that's when I probably will uh, I'll be out. <laughs> but you know we we've really established our I would say our kind of our niches like really really well, and so now it's about just being hyper-focused and then focusing on scale. Um, scale doesn't mean we have to get to billions and billions of dollars. Like, I, you know, you know, myself and business partner, we, we've talked about it quite a quite a bit. Um, you know, when it stops being fun, it's, you know, that's that's kind of, you know, yeah. nice to have fun when we work, right? Yeah. So, no doubt. Um, but, you know, we've got a really good niche and I think it's kind of, we can grow as much or as little as we as we want. But right now we're in, you know, pretty, pretty solid growth mode. What do you think the best business advice you ever got was? Hmm. Uh, I mean, someone told me before that there there are riches in the niches. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so we, we do we do we are we are pretty um we are pretty um niche if 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 you yeah. will right and so you know, that that's that's probably one um, I don't know I've I've had a, I've had a lot of good a lot of good mentors some I don't want to 
some things I don't, I, I don't want to particularly say on the podcast, <laughs> potentially, unless you have a button here uh, for, for that. But we've, no, had yeah. some, we've had some pretty insane things yeah. in this room in a very short period of time this year. Yeah. Even <laughs> I could, from yeah. We had one guest in here tell us that they uh, I, all I simply did was ask them how they came up with the name of their company. And they told us that they went on what was called a sound bath. Do you know what a sound bath I don't is? Know. A sound bath is when you go off to a little um, quiet place. Sometimes it's very guarded, and, or not guarded, but sometimes very guided mm-hmm. through a mushroom trip. Okay. Yeah. And, you, and and that mushroom trip came up with this name. And it's a great name. It's an awesome story. And it's so worth listening to how it mm-hmm. came up. And I, I mean, it's, it's cool. Move forward, a recruiter for a large, recru- a large recruiting firm came in talked literally within two weeks about also f- going on a sound bath called it something different he called it an adventure in mushrooms but it was the same <laughs> setup and then earlier last week we had someone give us some of their best advice um a marine an underwater marine diver who owns a diving company gave us some excellent advice which i won't repeat on this but i would ask them <laughs> simply what was the best advice you ever got on your uh um on a job site and Boom, it came out. And so you can hear that on uh, the episode with Tim Wakefield. <laughs> you can listen to yourself if you want, truth be warned. But yeah. mm-hmm. um, what do you think is some good advice you you would share with other folks? And if you give them one piece of advice, they're starting out, maybe you could share, we'll flip the question. How? What would you tell them they could do to best suit themselves and make it successful? Yeah, so I have a good answer for that one. So, I mean, it, it's really, it's, it's kind of simplistic, right? So, you know, avoid shiny objects. like do that. Do not go chasing shiny objects. Stay focused and grind. I mean, it's like the first few years are going to suck. Like it just kind of is what it is. And it's like, so but true. you got to, you got to enjoy that, that piece of the business as, as well. And like, so, you know, avoid shiny objects, focus, you know, also pause and look back and like, see what you've done. Like I've done a pretty poor job of that until recently mm-hmm. of, you know, looking back, like, oh, you know, when we started, we had, you know, three people, we've got 40 now and, you know, we've got, you know, X millions of dollars under management, you know, that we're deploying for, for folks as well. So, you know, you know, yeah, I don't suck as bad as I think I suck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Gra- good old fashioned gratitude exercise yeah. goes a long way. Yeah, for um, sure. But at the same time, don't believe your press clippings either. Yes. You're not as bad, but you're also not as good. Got to be humble too. <laughs> yeah. You got to be humble. <laughs> no, no doubt. Um, what do you think the most underrated skill in the industry is? Hmm. Sure. Um, I think, I think the ability to make real, honestly, real time decisions on the spot and work on structure within minutes of meeting a small business. I think that's severely lacking. I think a lot of folks either want to defer to, to, to other people either internally or externally, but you know, it's like, I I love nothing more than talking to a small business owner Mm -hmm. for 15 minutes and like literally sketching out on a piece of paper of, this is the solution I think would work for like your particular opportunity or, or problem set. Um, I think that's really lacked. I think, especially within the banking world, there's way too much regulation, like so, not a whole lot of decisioning going on. Um, and the alternative lending market, like we have, we have the perfect opportunity to structure solutions that are extremely fast and beneficial for all parties involved. I think that's that's been lost a little bit, I feel like. All right, last question for you. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that I, I should have. I mean, you asked kind of what the, the plan was and it's kind of, you know, the TBD, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think, uh, I think you got to cover pretty well. Good. I don't know. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, I got last, one last question, actually. How do people find you? So, hey, man, I love listening to McLean. This guy's awesome. Thanks so much, Scott, for having him on your show. Now, how do I find this guy? Yes. I mean, you can give uh, me on link, LinkedIn. I'm pretty good about responding uh, there. Um, you know, we've got... You know, emails at both companies that you can you can respond. They'll, they'll make their way. They'll make their way to me uh, as well. So that's the the best way to reach out. And we, we have you know awesome sales folks and underwriters on all, all across the board. So cool. you ping anybody, they'll, they'll get back to you. And if they don't, let me know. Nice. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so. Well, dude, I really appreciate you coming in. I'm so grateful you came in. I think the conversation today is very helpful to people get different perspective. That's what I wanted people to see. Yeah. What's it like the lending world? What's it like in the mind of a lender? So many times people want to know. They wonder. Um, I can tell them all day long, but it's great for me to ask somebody else that we work together. Um, I hope people take our story, how we met. I hope they take that part. If they take nothing from this, mm-hmm. take that for the most part. That's how we started this whole conversation and how we met. But also, there's so many different forms of lending. Ask the right questions. Be prepared. Help yourself. Help the mm-hmm. good people. Help yourself find the good people mm-hmm. and then help the good people that you actually want to work with help you. 
And those are the things I hope people take with from today. So thank you. No, perfect. Thanks for having me as well. Yes. Well, everybody, please hit up McLean and I on LinkedIn. If you're not connected with us already, get connected with us. Um, you can, of course, check this out on our YouTube channel. Please click subscribe. It's Mobilization Funding on YouTube. And we wish you all the best. Please share this with your friends. Let anyone know if you can help. Until the next time, God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.